speaker again. And we make a big jump uh, from uh, Basel to New Zealand. And uh, I don't really know what the next speaker is going to present because the, the title is so general. Uh, but maybe uh, you are also keen to know uh, what uh, the presentation will be about. And it is entitled uh, Recent Development in uh, Measurement for Nanomedicine. And the talk is given uh, by Hans van der Vorn. Please. Floor, just yes. waiting for my slides. So yes, my talk is actually slides. a little bit similar to some of the other ones in that I'm going to talk about functionalization, but not on a cantilever or a wire, but on nanoparticles. So we've coined this term lab on a particle. So we're looking at reactions on nanoparticles and using our uh, tools to measure that. So uh, I come from a company called Eyes on Science. Most of the time now I live in Oxford in England. Um, some of, most of you might have heard of us, but we make nanoparticle measuring equipment using nanopores to measure particles. So I'm going to talk briefly about the nano measurement context for nanomedicine, a little bit about the background to what we call TRPS, tunable resistive pulse sensing, and then I'm going to focus on charge and charge distribution, which is a little bit like some of the other talks. So our view on nanomedicine measurement, one of the reasons that nanomedicine doesn't make progress very fast is that most of the measurement is not very good, I'm sorry. Um, people want to get caught up in the dream but don't want to do the basic work. Um, that may not apply to the people in this room because some of that work was quite precise. Um, nanoparticle constructs can be somewhat complex but not really that difficult to measure properly. A DLS measurement, which is the most common, is the most unsuitable and that's somewhat ironic for me as an engineer to just see how that just carries on. And for medical adoption, uh, the field needs accurate, repeatable, verifiable data with medical meaning. So, you know, DLS type of data will never, ever give you that. Um, in terms of translation, we're doing nano-engineering with the nanoparticles, therefore you need the precise measurement. In general, quality assurance is done by having a very large uh, set of protocols of how you make it, uh, as opposed to a much smaller set of protocols of what, what are the properties of the particles that you've made. Uh, and we think that's a grey area, and if you reinvented nanomedicine measurement a little bit, life would be faster and cheaper for everybody. Um, this is a paper that was published about uh, three or four years ago. So the top one is, uh, this is measuring, everyone's measuring the same thing, but it's three different particle types mixed together, and everybody's in agreement with what they are. Uh, when you use DLS, you get this uh, artificial curve, when you use uh, NTA or PTA as they called it, you get a somewhat similar curve but focused on the uh, smallest particles. When you use TRPS, you get not only can you separate the three particles out, they're in proportion to the number and while they've used percentage here, actually you could give the actual number of particles quite easily and we think that's the preferred method of measurement. You have the number of particles and the size of the particles in a real and accurate distribution as opposed to this which is somewhat meaningless and this at least shows the separation of the three particles but you haven't quite got the proportionality. So that's I think the key point. You can achieve that resolution with a little bit of work. What do you measure for nanomedicine? The particle concentration needs to be by size, not just the number, the real size distribution, particle charge and now relatively easy to get particle charge distribution and then you can use that to move on to these surface interactions, somewhat similar to the last couple of speakers. Calibration, someone mentioned controls earlier, everything needs to be calibrated, so every measurement is compared with a standard. The instruments look like that, you can see them on the table outside, but they're about quite that big. The next generation will be a lot smaller. Um, the system works by uh, having a one single pore, a nanoparticle passes through the pore, as it does that, it changes the current, uh, so we can use that blockade. The particle size, uh, the volume of the particle is determined by the depth of that current blockade. The electrophoretic mobility, I'll show you how that works in more detail, is by how long it takes to flow through the hole. And then you can measure the concentration of particles by looking at how frequently they go through and comparing the size. It's quite simple. Particle concentration, people think it's a number. It's a fundamental data point. I think in, in, in a medicine it's fundamental for dosage, what's actually being delivered. Uh, because people are used to using DLS, they don't typically measure it. 
Um, if it's monodispersed, a number has validity, but if it's not monodispersed, and, and many things are not, then you need to describe concentration by the size range that you're measuring. It's, a, it's an important point that few people get. And you can see there what happens if you have, this is for extracellular vesicles, um, if you just give a number and you're only measuring uh, between the two red lines, then that number will be different than what is actually there, because there's always some particles below or above what is being measured, uh, no matter what the technique. Um, this is just showing for liposome stability, just by way of showing if you have the number of particles up the, up the y-axis, as well as the size. In this case, you're looking at post-freezing and thawing. The profile changes. If you just have percentage, you miss that detail. Um, high resolution means that you just don't get that sort of random software generated curve that I showed you with the DLS before, but you're actually getting the detail. In this case, this is exosomes in cerebral spinal fluid, one a control and one for a person with Alzheimer's disease. Um, now, I'm going to talk about charge briefly, because that, well, not so briefly, because that's really what I want to talk about. Uh, why zeta potential? Everybody is familiar with it, but what is actually measured is electrophoretic mobility. So it's not always the best way to describe charge, and it's an artificial concept, but everybody is used to it, so that's why it carries on. We quite like people to use electrophoretic mobility. Uh, what is zeta potential? You've got this uh, surface uh, layer here, so it's the voltage at the slip plane is the definition of what zeta potential is. Um, but of course you've got this uh, artificial round ball, a little bit of gold or, or a bit of a ball looking thing, when you move into nanobioconstructs, you don't have that anymore. So that concept, in my opinion, ceases to have too much relevance. But we keep using it because everybody insists on it. But I think there's a real limitation to being stuck with that simplified model. Um, it's just more of that. So this is how TRPS measures electrophoretic mobility. So remember, you've got a particle going through a hole one by one. Uh, it disrupts the current. Uh, so what we're looking at is three components that drive the velocity. You've got fluid flowing through the hole, convection. You've got electrophoretic mobility of the particle. And you've got electrosmosis, which is the counterflow of ions up the side of the hole. So we have those three components. And what we do is measure in a, fairly de in a very detailed way the velocity of the fluid and particles to extract the electrophoretic mobility of each particle as it goes through the hole. So this is the type of plot you can come up with. So this is zeta potential versus size, quite simple. And you can actually do that in three dimensions to get number as well. Um, this is what happens if you measure mixed two particle sets together. So in this case, they're measured individually. Uh, this is the measurement you get with uh, PALS or DLS. And when you mix them with, um, measure them mixed together, you still get the separation. Whereas you measure them with your DLS, you get this number here at the bottom which will vary depending on the nature of the particles, not just the charge, but the concentration of the particles and the size of the particles. So then this becomes an unreliable method of measuring charge because of the other variables that will vary that result. Whereas in this case, you can separate that out one by one. So we're working closely with uh, Loughborough University, uh, Dr. Mark Platt and his group. So recently they had a paper on the cover of Langmuir uh, the work was about uh, adding little bits of DNA to particles, a little bit similar to the talk on uh, cantilevers before. Uh, the way that the electrophoretic mobility is being measured is the concept of a full half with maximum, but extended to a lot more detail around, around the position of the pore. So the concept is the full half with maximum occurs at the same point in a conical pore, independently of the size of the particle. So that was a little, little breakthrough when you all worked that out. Um, and that's because the full half with maximum occurs at a ratio of the inlet diameter to whatever the diameter is at the full half with maximum. Is that everyone happy with that? And so there's a number of models where you can measure it at one point or four or five points with increasing complexity or accuracy. Um, so here's some examples. So this is some work that was published recently by the National Physical Laboratory in the UK, which is uh, the, more or less the equivalent of NIST, I guess, uh, Caterina Manelli. Um, they make, they were doing work with silica nanoparticles and looking at the corona. So it's the interaction of silica and, and, and proteins. Uh, they did make the comment quite clearly that the DLS was incapable of providing an accurate measurement of the nanoparticles in serum because of the, because of the presence of agglomerates. So you're trying to 
work with physiological systems that are more complex than just DI water and monospheric nanoparticles, so therefore you need a technique that operates better. So you can see the comparison of the charge. I won't go through in too much detail because of time. Um, this is some work done with the DNA modified particles. So this is working towards this lab on a particle concept. So this is done at Loughborough as part of a PhD project by Emma Blundell. So in this case, they're adding single strand and DNA to particles. Uh, you can see that the different um, uh, amounts of DNA cause different zeta potential of the particles um, and different translocation time through the hole. Okay, so, um, and this is now the number of bases. So these are quite small bits of DNA, so they can analyse 10, 25, 36, and 50 difference between them in terms of the zeta potential, they can also change the molarity and go back and pick that up. So that's getting back to a little bit like the cantilever where you're measuring a DNA hybridisation, um, but they went an extra step further and started looking at, well, where do you bind the DNA and does it matter? Okay. And so they were then hybridising it selectively at different points, uh, in some cases in the middle, some cases in the end showing that actually those things exhibit zeta, different zeta potential with degree of electrophoretic mobility, even though the total amount of charge, the total amount of DNA is the same, all that's different is the position of the hybridisation. So that then provides quite a detailed tool. If you think about the DNA as being possibly an aptomer, and then an aptomer changes its form as it's binding to something else, it's a 3D structure, so then you're looking for measuring the change in form of a piece of DNA, not just the amount of DNA. So they extended that. So the key points here are you've got uh, number two over here, uh, which has got single strand. The second, this is the, this is the control, the single strand binded to the nanoparticle. Uh, this is the single strand bound uh, uh, where it's fully covered. And this is the strand number five where you've got half on, half off. And so they're able to show that the electrophoretic mobility of those two are different and in fact uh, went the opposite way than, than a number of people like me predicted, where I predicted that would be uh, slower than that. In fact, it was the other way around. So um, that was quite an interesting way of measuring some fundamental issues around how DNA binds to itself. So it's not just does it hybridise, but where does it hybridise? And, and that's, the, that's the toolkit that you, can, that you could have. Um, this is just showing more detail. This is quite old work, but this is going through an aptima-based project, looking at aptima binding to estrogen, uh, and just showing how you get these different, when you get the binding occurring, you get these various different profiles, not with going the detail of it, but there's a lot of detail that you can get out of it. So this is a simple commercial system. You don't have to reinvent everything. Um, and largely the talk, um, we're talking about reinventing measurement, nano measurement in particular, real measurements not cartoons, the concentration needs to have a size range, size distribution should preferably have the particle number not just the percentage, and zeta potential is derived from electrophoretic mobility, so it isn't always applicable, and this precise particle opposed to charge, this lab on a particle, if you want to call it that, offers a whole lot of valuable new information, and here the people that are involved, these are all the Lufra people, and Dr. Robert Vogel from Eyes on Australia has worked with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Is there any question from the audience? We have first here. Well, it's not necessary. It's not necessary. <laughs> okay. I understand uh, that uh, you push your sample uh, through just uh, one single pore, correct? Yes. If, uh, if you take uh, something uh, like uh, Doxil, uh, with uh, about uh, 100,000 uh, uh, liposomes in a single microliter, how much uh, will you dilute your sample before you manage a measurement anything? Uh, for a liposome like Doxa, which is I think 100 odd nanometers, then typically you'd be running that about 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 particles per ml, and you can speed up and slow down the rate of flow with pressure. So I didn't make a big thing about it, but the reason it's tunable resistive pulse sensing is you can tune the size of the hole, in a larger hole they'll flow through faster, and you can also increase the pressure and they'll flow through faster. So, so, so you might dilute... Undiluted? Well, the, the, the optimum range for a particle that size is about 10 to the 9 particles per ml. 
So but I don't principle know what you're is the, the Coulter principle. It is, it is the Coulter principle yeah, so extended, I, yeah, yeah. Where one can uh, measure a lot of Correct. particles, so it's yeah. just given by the frequency of instrument, and I think yeah. it's really high. So from my point of view, it should work, but totally it's nothing cool. new, so it's really well established from my point of view. The underlying physics was yeah, correct. Was it was 60 years old? So you can, if you've got, if you want to measure a representative sample, you might say 1,000 particles is enough, which is very very difficult to do on EM. Or you might want to do 10,000. You choose. It just takes a little bit longer. But we're bringing out a chip that'll have 10 holes in parallel as well. That means you can speed that up by tenfold or measure 10 10 x less uh, concentration. Thank you. Okay, there's another question. Barbara, please. Thank you. Can you do your measurements in a crowded environment? So this means uh, in cell culture medium containing fetal calf serum? Well, we've got another, a large part of what we do is extracellular vesicles, uh, more than nanometers, in fact, and a lot of them are in cell culture medium. So what we've done now is we've developed a, a set of tools which extract uh, a nice clean sample out of the cell culture medium or out of plasma, and they are uh, basically a type of size exclusion chromatography column. So if it's very, very messy, it's not that you can't do it, but it, it, you, get, you get particles blocking the hole or protein blocking the hole. Uh, we do a lot of DLS measurements and we do dynamic depolarized light scattering measurements in complex medium, so this means in situ over time, over 24, 48 hours. So I think these two methods are complementary and should yeah. be combined, but not focusing Yeah, yeah they do on different things. So if you've got a complex sample, you measure the complexity because you're measuring the, the, the range. But we've got a new pore coding system, so if you previously, a protein might bind to the side of the pore, and then that changes the behavior of the pore. So it's for vesicles, we now purify the vesicles with the columns and then measure them and you get very, very accurate, repeatable results. We've done trials all around the world with six different groups in different parts of the world are combining their results to see what's the variation you get between users and instruments. And, and if you use the columns, that variation comes down a lot. If you don't use the columns, it's quite high. Yeah, the light scattering you have shown is really uh, very crude, so I think sure. uh, totally. there are much yeah. better systems available yeah. today. Yeah. And I also think that uh, your measurements concerning the zeta potential is really not 100% state of the art. So uh, I have also some problems with the uh, drawing you have shown because I think uh, yeah, we measure some uh, potential and to show just the, uh, the, um, <laughs> the distribution of a, of I, I've, a I've simplified charges. it down totally <laughs> because I've got 12 minutes, but I had, there seemed to be 50 different slides, so mm. I thought, well, I've got 12 minutes, mm. but we okay. can, I can talk to you in the break. But okay, you're, you're maybe right. we yeah. can continue during the break, have yeah. a discussion about uh, this new, newer kind of instrument.